Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the fourth of the first month, with which happens to line up with the 18th of March on 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And since we have Pesach coming up pretty soon, it, it's going to be here in the next week and a half. I thought it'd be a good time to go over this section again with everybody. And this is from section three of I believe it's book seven. I'll have to double check. But this is from what's called the Apostolic Constitutions. And it has how we're supposed to keep the Pesach week, walking it out like our Mashiach and his taught ones did. So you can find this information in the common scriptures when you look at Yahukanon chapter 12, Luke chapter 21, Matthew Yahu or Matthew chapter, I believe it's 21. And then um, it's from book five. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Sister Cindy. Um, but yeah, Matthew, Yahoo 21, and then Mark chapter 11. All of those start where you can read about the Passion Week, specifically it starts around the 10th of the first month when he comes into Yerushalayim, which is a type of when the lamb was brought into the home to be watched and to check for blemishes for four days to make sure it's perfect. But back on track here, we're just going to go ahead and read through this again. Again, This is what he walked out and what he enjoins believers to do who are partakers of the truth, right? So from the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 5, Section 3, on feast days and fast days, a catalog of the feasts of Yahuwah which are to be kept, and when each of them ought to be observed. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually cover what we do over every single feast. I don't know why, but it's missing like what we do in the latter half of the year in detail. But it says, brethren... Observe the festival days, and first of all, the Kodesh, which you are to celebrate on the first of the first month, and let this solemnity be observed before the fast of the Passover, beginning from the first day of the week and ending at the day of the preparation. Meaning, your fast begins on day one of the Passion Week and ends on prep day. You break your fast on the Shabbat, right? Which we'll get into. After which solemnities begin the set-apart week of the Passover, fasting in the same, all of you with fear and trembling, praying in them for those that are about to perish. This is concerning the passion of our Master, or Yahuwah, and what was done on each day of his sufferings, and concerning Yahuda and that Yahuda was not present when Yahuwah delivered the mysteries to his Talmudim, or taught ones. It says, For they began to hold a council against Yahuwah on the first day of the week, in the first month, which is Abib. And the deliberation continued on the second day of the week. But on the third day, they determined to take away his life by impalement which is what you can read in Matthew Yahu 26, 1 through 5, Mark 14, 1 and 2, and Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 6, where they bring him before Pilatus and say, impale him, impale him. That would have been the third day of the week, or what we call, uh, it's the 14th of the first month, what we'd call Pesach. It says, And Yahuda, knowing this, who for a long time had been perverted, but was then smitten by the devil himself with the love of money. Although he had been long entrusted with the purse, Yahukanon 12.6, and used to steal what was set apart for the needy. Yet was he not cast off by Yahuwah through much long suffering. Nay, and when we were once feasting with him, being willing both to reduce him to his duty and instruct us in his own foreknowledge, he said, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, that one of you will betray me. 
and every one of us saying, is it I? Which you can read in Yahoo Canaan 13 or Matthew Yahoo 26. And Yahuwah being silent, I who was one of the twelve, and more beloved by him than the rest, arose from, this is talking about Yahoo Canaan, right? But the one whom Yahushua loved, yeah, that's for a different story. I'm not entirely certain that he was one of the twelve emissaries, but I believe that was Eleazar or Lazarus of the column. And if you read through the account in Yahoo Canaan, every mention of the one whom Yahushua loved, who was beloved by him, was Eleazar, including the one it says at the end of that book that, that wrote the, that account. So for a, a second witness to that, you have him being given the duty of Miriam to watch over her after our Mashiach is taken. And if you look into secular history or the accounts in regard to what happened to them, Yahusuf of Arimathea, Miriam, and Lazarus, or Eleazar, were all part of his believers that were put into a ship in the Mediterranean and cast off without sails or oars or, or rudder. And they ended up crashing or landing in Marcel. And he took her there, Lazarus or Eleazar specifically, for the last part of her life. He eventually came back over to Ephesus and was doing his ministry there later on when he was an old man. But in between those times, they don't really have a record of anything he was doing. So I think he came back with a different name. But before then, it, you actually have the record of Eleazar or Lazarus being the one that was taking care of Miriam, which goes along with what's in the account of the book of Yahukadon itself for who was the one writing it and who was given that charge or duty to do. Back on point, it says, Yet neither then did our good Yahuwah declare his name. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. And Yahuwah being silent, I who was one or was with one of the twelve, and more beloved by him than the rest, arose up from lying in his bosom, and besought him to tell who it should be that should betray him. Yet neither then did our good Yahuwah declare his name, but gave two signs of the betrayer, one by saying, He that dips with me in the dish, a second, to whom I shall give the sop when I have dipped it. Nay, although he himself said, Master, is it I? The master did not say, Yes, but you have said. And being willing to affright him in the matter, he said, Woe to that man by whom the son of Adam is betrayed. Good were it for him if he had never been born. Who, when he had heard that, went his way and said to the Kohanim, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? <clears throat> and they bargained with him for thirty pieces of silver. Matthew Yahu 26.15 and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the house of the potter. Matthew Yahu 27, 9 and 10, and Zakar Yahu chapter 11. And on the second day of the week, when we had eaten the supper with him, and when Yahuda had dipped his hand into the dish and received the sop and had gone out by night, Yahuwah said to us, The hour has come that you shall be dispersed and shall leave me alone. Yahukanon 16.32 and Matthew Yahu 26.31 And everyone vehemently affirming that we would not forsake him, I, Kepha, adding this promise that I would even die with him, he said, Amen, I say unto you, before the crock crows, you shall thrice deny that you know me. Luke twenty-two thirty-four. And when he had delivered to us the representative mysteries of his precious body and blood, Yahuda not being present with us, he went out to the Mount of Olives, near the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. Yahukanon 18.1 And we were with him and sang a hymn according to the custom. 
Matith Yahu 2630. And being separated not far from us, he prayed to his father, saying, Father, remove this cup away from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And when he had done this thrice, while we, out of despondency of mind, were fallen asleep, he came and said, The hour has come, and the son of Adam is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And behold, Yahudah, and with him a multitude of unrighteous men. Luke 22.47, Matith Yahu 26.47 And whom, or to whom he shows the signal by which he was to betray him? A deceitful kiss. You see the same thing happen with Yahuab, who was the general of Dawid's armies, the son of Zeru Yahu, the the. Zeruiah was the sister of Dawid. So Yahuab, Abishai, and um, their younger brother who was killed by uh, Abner. I can't remember his name at the moment. But all three of them were sons of Zeruiah, his nephews. And that's why he wouldn't, he, he couldn't do anything against them. They were too strong for him, he said but that's for another time. Either way, Yahuab killed two men more righteous than he, and Abner he killed with a deceitful kiss, kissed him and then stabbed him. <clears throat> and it says, Yet they, when they had received the signal agreed on, took hold of the master, and having bound him, they led him to the house of Caiapha, the high Kohen, Wherein were assembled many, not the people, but a great rout, not a set-apart council, but an assembly of the wicked and a council of the unrighteous, who did many things against him and left no kind of injury untried, spitting upon him, cavilling at him, beating him, smiting him on the face, reviling him, tempting him, seeking vain divination instead of true foretellings from him, calling him a deceiver, a blasphemer, a transgressor of Moshe, a destroyer of the temple, a taker away of the sacrifices, an enemy to the Romans, an adversary to Caesar. And these reproaches did these bulls and dogs in their madness cast upon him which alludes to Psalm 22. Till it was very early in the morning, and then they led him away to Hanana, or Hanan, who was father-in-law to Caiapha. And when they had done the like things to him there, it being the day of the preparation, meaning the preparation of the high Shabbat of unleavened bread, so this was on the Pesach, the 14th day of the first month, right? They delivered him to Pilate, the Roman governor, accusing him of many and great things, none of which they could prove. Just real quick. This is the calendar for anyone, since we went over this before it was recorded. But all of the accounts generally... Yahukanon chapter 12 starts with him six days before the Pesach, right here on the ninth of the first month. And the other three accounts, they have him coming in, Yarushalayim, and that's on the tenth day of the first month. And then for four days, the lamb is inspected. You had him these four days being talked to by the people. And then it was on the 13th, in at evening they had the last supper he washed their feet they went out to the garden to pray he was taken in the middle of the night mistreated by his own abuse taken to Hanan, also abused and then brought before Pilate in the beginning of the, the 14th day he was accused and convicted by the third hour he was impaled at the sixth hour and he gave up the ruach at the ninth hour and then he would, as you'll see, he was buried before sunset on the 14th day. And then he would have spent all that night. The 15th day was the first full day he was in the ground. 
which was the Shabbat, the unleavened bread, okay, where he came preaching his death until he returns, fourth day of the week, right? Sun, moon, and stars. That's for a different time. But then he was three days, three nights in the belly of the earth, and he rose before dawn on the Shabbat. And that is representative of the truth through history until the millennial reign, too. But we'll go over that in more detail some other time. However, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to Miriam and Ma Miriam of Magdala and the other Miriam. And then later that night in the evening when the 11 were assembled together, he appears to all of them. But Toma isn't with him. They find Toma, but he doesn't believe. And he says, unless he touches him, which he would not permit them to do here. He said, unless that he touches him and puts his fingers in his side and sees the, and puts his hands in the, the holes in his hands and feet, he will by no means believe. So it says, accordingly, after eight days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, after eight days, in the evening of first fruits, they gathered together with Toma, and he appeared to them and allows them to touch him because he's already ascended to his father here. And that perfectly walks out the calendar. And then it was from this day until 40 days later, which was accordingly 10 days, the fifth day of the week right here. This is when he ascends into the Shemaim and he says the promise of the Father is coming soon. And they have to wait until Shavuot when they pour out the Ruach on them and they speak with renewed tongues and they have their born again with the Ruach and fire, right? So everything walks out just like the Exodus walks out the calendar perfectly. So does his Passion Week. All right, so I believe we were right here. It says, whereupon the governor, after they accused him of many and great things, none of which they could prove, right? Whereupon the governor, as out of patience with them, said, I find no cause against him. Luke 23, 14, Yahukanon 18, 38. But they bringing two lying witnesses desire to accuse the master falsely, but they being found to disagree, and so their testimony not conspiring together. They altered the accusation to that of treason, saying this fellow says that he is a king and forbids to give tribute to Caesar. Luke 23, 2. And they themselves became accusers, which they became devils, right? And witnesses and judges and authors of the sentence saying, impale him, impale him, Luke 23, 21, that it might be fulfilled, which is written by the foretellers concerning him. Unrighteous witnesses were gathered together against me, and unrighteousness lied to itself. And again, many dogs compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked laid siege against me. And elsewhere, my inheritance became to me as a lion in the wood and has sent forth her voice against me. And this last one was from Yahu 12.8. The middle one was from Psalm 22. And I believe this uh, first one was in Yeshiyahu, but I, I have to look that one up again. Or Zakariyahu, rather. Pilate, therefore, dishonoring his authority by his possibility, meaning his cowardliness, convicts himself of wickedness by regarding the multitude more than the, this righteous man, and bearing witness to him that he was innocent, yet as guilty, delivering him up to the punishment of the stake. Although the Romans had made laws that no man unconvicted should be put to death, but the executioners took Yahuwah of esteem and nailed him to the stake, impaling him indeed at the sixth hour, but having received the sentence of his condemnation at the third hour. After this they gave him or to him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. Then they divided his garments by lot. Then they impaled two malefactors with him, 
on each side one, that it might be fulfilled which was written. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty they gave me vinegar to drink. And again, they divided my garments among themselves, and upon my vesture have they cast lots. And in another place, and I was reckoned with the transgressors. And that one's in Yeshayahu 53.12. Then there was darkness for three hours, from the sixth to the ninth, and again light in the evening. As it is written, It shall not be day nor night, and at the evening there shall be light. All which things, when those malefactors saw that were impaled with him, the one of them reproached him as though he was weak and unable to deliver himself. But the other rebuked the ignorance of his fellow, and turning to Yahuwah as being enlightened by him, and acknowledging who he was that suffered, he prayed that he would remember him in his Malkuth, or kingdom, hereafter. He then presently, and this is the thing a lot of people say, well, you don't need to do anything. Look at the sinner on the stake with him. But he confessed the truth, acknowledged his own sin, and willfully took the punishment that was put, his chastisement that was given to him. Didn't complain about his situation. And because of what he did, confessed, forsook, and acknowledged the truth, praised our maker, and, and, and witnessed to him amongst others, that was what he did. So there was works-based belief in his, in even the little amount of time that he had. But see, he then presently granted him the forgiveness of his former sins and brought him to, into paradise to enjoy the mystical good things, who also cried out about the ninth hour and said to his father, My El, my El, why have you forsaken me? And a little afterward, when he had cried with a loud voice, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and had added into your hands, I commit my Ruach, he gave up the Ruach and was buried before sunset in a new sepulcher. But when the Shabbat dawned, he arose from the dead and fulfilled those things which before his passion he foretold to us saying the son of Adam must continue in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And when he was risen from the dead, he appeared first to Miriam Magdalene, or Magdala, and Miriam, the mother of Jacob, then to Colapis, Cleopas, or Cleophas, in the way, who was his uncle, according to the flesh. And after that to us his taught ones, who had fled away for fear of the Yahudim, but privately were very inquisitive about him. But these things are also written in the good news. And this is the gist of the passion, what we've gone over. When you read through the four different accounts, you should see this lining up right along with the calendar that we just went over as well. So of the great week, and on what account they enjoin us to fast on the fourth and sixth days. Okay. This fourth and sixth day fasting is, is predominantly throughout the year in remembrance of these things. If you remember our Mashiach, when he's offered food, he says, I have food of which you know not. Right. And he says that his food is to do the will of the one who sent him. You find in certain instances where he hasn't eaten or anything. And then when he talks to his taught ones about certain things, like why they could not cast out a certain demon, he says this one or such as these only come out through fasting and prayer. He continually fasted and he enjoined his taught ones to do the same. Not every single day, although you have record of Kepha, if you look at the Dead Sea, or at the recognitions of Clement, he abstained from delicacies. He didn't eat fancy foods at all. He survived off bread and herbs. He was very, he was very um, humble in what he took in because he was continually fasting so that he could cast out all demons. In the same way, believers were enjoined to fast the fourth and sixth days of the week 
to use what they would eat to give to those in need. And they were always fasting in righteousness in this capacity. You also have witness of, um, there's at least one account in the Fox's Book of the Martyrs about a gentleman who was very pious and he said that he would skip one mil in three to give to those in need. So even during the times of the Dark Ages, when they had none of these writings, people were still doing and walking out these things as they were able. This is a wonderful witness. But right here, he gives you the reason for why they do their perpetual fasting on specific days, okay? It says, he therefore charged us himself to fast these six days on, to, on account of the impiety and transgression of the Yahudim. Matthew Yahoo 9:15, Luke 5:34 and 35, and Mark 2:19, commanding us withal to be well over them and lament for their perdition. So, what we should be doing during Pesach is to lament and mourn over those that are lost, that like the son of perdition that betrayed our Mashiach those that profess to be believers but don't live according to his will have they're the reason why he suffers they're the reason why he went through what he did and real believers are not supposed to rejoice over that or to mock or to do anything other than lament and wail right for even he himself wept over them because they knew not the time of their visitation which in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's one called the uh, Exhortation from the Damascus document, and it talks about the two Ruachoth, or I could be I could be mixing that up, but there's a section, it might be in the community rule, where it speaks of the two Ruachoth, or the two spirits that rule over man. And depending on which one you choose to serve what ruach you have manifesting in you you're going to have different characteristics it's either malkish malkirasha the king of evil or malkizedek the king of righteousness that's going to have rule over you and depending on the ruach in you at the time of the visitation would determine whether or not you are condemned and cursed or you're receiving healing and miraculous things so exactly like when he came in the flesh, depending on people's, the Ruach in them was whether or not that happened to them. It's very, very spot on for what you can see in the accounts of his good news and what it says in there for how he's going to deal with people. But the same is true when he returns. The Ruach in us at his visitation will determine whether or not you're his or not. And you know, you'll be known by your fruits or what you produce, the things that you do whether it's of the fruits of the Ruach, the fruits of the Spirit, if you will, or the fruits of the adversary, the flesh. But it says, For even he himself wept over them, because they knew not the time of their visitation. But he commanded us to fast on the fourth and sixth days of the week, the former on account of his being betrayed, and representing the day that he was dead, right, the fourth day of the week, when he came, it says he came preaching his death until he returns, right? And the latter on account of his passion. But he appointed us to break our fast on the seventh day at the cock crowing, but to fast on the Shabbat, Yom, meaning the weekly Sabbath, what we call unleavened bread, which is the first day that he was buried in the earth. And they'll explain that a little lower. Not that the Sabbath day is a day of fasting, being the rest from the creation, but because we ought to fast on this one Sabbath only, while on this day the Creator was under the earth. For on their very feast day they apprehended Yahuwah, that the oracle might be fulfilled which says, They placed their signs in the middle of their feast, and knew them not. You ought therefore to be well over them, because when Yahuwah came, they did not believe in him, but rejected his doctrine, judging themselves unworthy of deliverance. 
You therefore are happy, who once were not a people, but are now a set-apart nation, delivered from the deceit of idols, from ignorance, from impiety, who once had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy through your hearty obedience. For to you the converted nations is opened the gates of life, who formerly were not beloved, but are now beloved, a people ordained for a possession of Elohim, to show forth his virtues, concerning whom our Deliverer said, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest to them that asked not after me. I said, Behold me to a nation which did not call upon my name. For when you did not seek after him, then were you sought for by him. And you who have believed in him have hearkened to his call, and have left the madness of polytheism, and have fled to the true monarchy, to El Shaddai, through Mashiach Yahushua, and have become the completion of the number of the delivered, ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That is a, an enumeration that's also mentioned for the messengers that are surrounding the throne of our Father on high and our Mashiach. And that's also an allusion to the Baraka given to Ephraim, the thousands of thousands, or the ten thousands times ten thousands, and then the thousands and thousands of, are of Manasseh, who is given the birthright covenant blessing or Baraka of the double portion and the innumerable seed. But that is for allusion that's mentioned from Daniel chapter 7, verse 10. As it is written in Dawid, a thousand fall beside you and ten thousand at your right hand. And again, the chariots of El are by tens of thousands and thousands of the prosperous. But unto unbelieving Yisrael, he says, All day long I have stretched out mine hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people which go in a way that is not good, but after their own sins, a people provoking me before my face. Yeshayahu 65, 2. And this is alluding to him hanging from the stake with his arms outstretched and, and, and hammered to the, the wood there. All day long, he from the third hour, or from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, he was like that before them. It's also mentioned by Moshe when he says, and your life will be hanging before you and you shall not perceive your life. And he, our Mashiach, is our life and length of days. So, this is an enumeration of the foretold predictions which declare Mashiach, whose completion, or whose, yeah, completion, though the Yahudim saw, Yet out of the evil temper of their mind, they did not believe he was the Mashiach of El, and condemned Yahuwah of esteem to the stake. It says, see how the people provoked Yahuwah by not believing in him. Therefore, he says, they provoked the set-apart Ruach, and he was turned to be their enemy. Yes, Yahu 63.10 for blindness is cast upon them by reason of the wickedness of their mind. Because when they saw Yahushua, they did not believe him to be the Mashiach of El, who was before all ages begotten of him, his only begotten son, or his Yahid Ben. El Dabar, or El the Word, whom they did not own through their unbelief, neither account or neither on account of his mighty works, nor yet on account of the foretellings which were written concerning him. For that he was to be born of a virgin, they read this foretelling. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, whose government is upon his shoulders, and his name is called the messenger of his great counsel, the wonderful counselor, 
the mighty El, the King, the Prince of Peace, the Father of the future age. Now that because of their exceeding great wickedness they would not believe in him, Yahuwah shows in these words, Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yahuwah been revealed? And afterward, hearing you shall hear and shall not comprehend, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive, for the heart of this people has grown gross. Wherefore knowledge was taken from them, because seeing they overlooked, and hearing they heard not. But to you the converted of the nations is the kingdom given. Because you who knew not Elohim have believed by preaching, and have known him, or rather are known of him, through Yahushua, the deliverer and redeemer of those that expect in him. For you are translated from your former vain and tedious mode of life, and have contemned the lifeless idols, and despised the demons which are in darkness, and have run to the true light. Yahukanon 1 9. And by it have known the one and only true El and Father. Yahukanon 17 3. And so are owned to be heirs of his kingdom. For since you have been immersed into Yahuwah's death, Romans 6, 3, and into his resurrection, as newborn babes, 1 Kepha 2, 2, you ought to be wholly free from all sinful actions. Shepherd of Hermas, Book 2, Fourth Command. For you are not your own, but his that bought you, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, with his own blood. For concerning the former Yisrael, Yahuwah speaks thus on account of their unbelief. The kingdom of Elohim shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matith Yahu 21, 43. That is to say, that having given the kingdom to you who were once far estranged from him, he expects the fruits of your gratitude and probity. For you are those that were once sent into the vineyard and did not obey, but they, or but these they that did obey. But you have repented of your denial, and you work therein now. But they, being uneasy on account of their own covenants, have not only left the vineyard uncultivated, but have also killed the stewards of the master of the vineyard one with stones, another with the sword, one they sawed asunder, another they slew in the set-apart place between the temple and the altar. Nay, at last they cast the heir himself out of the vineyard and slew him. And by them he was rejected as an unprofitable stone, Matith Yahu 21.42, but by you was received as the cornerstone. Wherefore, he says concerning you, a people whom I knew not have served me, and at the hearing of the ear they have obeyed me. How the Passover ought to be celebrated. It is therefore your duty, brethren, who are redeemed by the precious blood of Mashiach, to observe the days of the Passover exactly with all care after the vernal equinox, which the equal day and night, as it mentions in Hanok chapter 72 and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the equal day and night is the last day of the 12th month. It's the 31st day of the 12th month, and then the next day, the fourth day of the week, is the first of the first month after the vernal equinox in the beginning of spring. So it says, observe the days of the Passover exactly with all care after the vernal equinox, lest you be obliged to keep the memorial of the one passion twice in the year. Keep it once only in a year for him that died but once. Do not you yourselves compute, but keep it 
when your brethren of the circumcision do so. Keep it together with them, and if they err in their computation, be not you concerned. Now, this is saying that you keep the festival with those of the circumcision that are also believers. And everyone that was of the circumcision that were believers were keeping the calendar that was kept by the Kohanim that was taken to Qumran and found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. As you, Ob willing, you guys will see how the Passion Accounts lines up exactly with the calendar we just saw, along with Creation Week, the Exodus, everything lines up with the, the what's walked out there perfectly. You can even go so far, and this is a little bit of a sidetrack here, but if you want to validate these things as perfectly certain in your mind, it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a list of who is serving in the in the Koha uh, in the temple or the Hekel during what feasts throughout the seasons for a 296 year period before it repeats itself. It goes through um, seven Yobelim sections before perfectly repeating. It starts with Gamal, number 22 in the order, which means rewarded. And then it will repeat with him after 296 years. But um, the list of the, the Kohanim, the sons of Zadok that were supposed to serve in the Hekel, is given 1 through 24, I believe. But the order that it starts with for calendar purposes with is number 22. And one of the signs that you see is it's always number 22 or number 10, Shekin, Shekin Yahu, which means Yahuwah will dwell. It's always on those when they're serving on the first during Pesach or on the first of the year when there's a full moon on the first day of the year as part of its sign of when it was first created the fourth day of the week. But um, back on track, if you look at all the different events that happened, particularly in the book of Yobelim, and you take the Jubilee or the Yobel that it happened in, the specific day or the week that these things happened, and you compare it to the list of who's supposed to be serving, you'll find that the, the name of the Kohen, the meaning of his name, is significantly foretelling the event that's going on. And it's unbelievably amazing, but you can do that with his Passion Week. You could do that with the Exodus. You could do that with the Creation Account. Pretty much any events where they have it marked for the Yo Bell, and the the month and the day or whatever, you can find out exactly who is serving and see how his name foretold the events that were transpiring at that time. So no one could have done that but our Creator, because the sons of Zadok weren't even alive at creation, but it predates that. All right, so back on track here. Keep your nights of watching in the middle of the days of unleavened bread. So the nights that you stay up to watch would have been the fourth, fifth, and sixth days, right? The middle of the days of unleavened bread before he's resurrected, but you're staying up to watch for it, right? And this is when you go out, you stay together, and you do your readings through the night if you're able to while you're fasting completely, as we'll read here, okay? And when, and if you can't keep all these nights, you, you can try to do one, right? You can try to keep it, as he said, but even his taught ones, they couldn't stay up with him one night. So the idea is you have to perfectly walk it out, but you want to do the best you can to follow after the truth and reflect them in creation, which is what keeping all these festivals is actually doing. But it says, keep your nights of watching in the middle of the days of unleavened bread. And when the Yahudim are feasting, do you fast and well over them? Because on the day of their feast, they staked Mashiach. And while they are lamenting and eating unleavened bread in bitterness, do you feast? But no longer be careful to keep the feast with the unbelieving Yahudim. For we have now no communion with them, for they have been led astray in regard to the calculation itself, meaning how to keep the calendar, right? 
which was also foretold in the book of Yobelim, which they think that they accomplished perfectly, that they may be led astray on every hand and be fenced off from the truth. So right here, because of their willful evil disposition, they are intentionally deluded and they think that they're following what is true, but they're not. That should terrify anybody who's fence sitting and not certain about certain things. If you're doing things that are evil, if you have malicious thoughts in your heart about others, if you're lying, cheating, stealing, committed adultery, whether physically or with your mind, right, by lusting after another, if you're doing any of these things, he knows. He's in the minds of all men, and we all get according to what we deserve. So we want to be very careful to always be about the truth and to be simple. To, to not have any thoughts about another that are evil, but to be like children in evil. It says, but do you observe carefully the vernal equinox, which occurs on the 31st of the 12th month, observing carefully until the 21st of the month, least the 14th of the month shall fall on another week, and an error being committed, you should, through ignorance, celebrate the Pesach or the Passover twice in the year. Or celebrate the day of the resurrection of our Yahuwah on any other day than a Shabbat. And I put specifically the 18th of the first month, always the seventh day of the week. Okay. Again. The dates that were originally written, and you anyone can read this for themselves. They put in the dates or the days of the week here to try to say that the three days and three nights was from a prep day or Friday, if you will, to a Sunday, which is it's known error. It's repudiated by Irenaeus, by uh, Herodot, not Herodotus, Hippolytus, by those that were taught ones of the taught ones that specifically mentioned he was the Passover lamb on Passovers when he died and he was resurrected on the Shabbat. And these things are mentioned by them. They knew them back then. But Rome killed off believers and, and marred the truth and made him disfigured. So it was hidden. However, when you line up the accounts with what actually transpired with the calendar, everything fits perfectly. And then things start to make more sense if you just take it for what it says and you don't add to it. One thing, and you'll have a lot of people disagree, but I'm not I'm not trying to argue with people. I'm just looking at the facts. They have the, in the Greek, it says one of the Sabbaths. And it was on one of the Sabbaths that they came to the tomb and he was risen. The first one was here when he was the first day buried. And this was one of them when they came and it was risen. There's nine mentions of the first day of the week that really should say one of the Sabbaths in scripture. Most of those accounts have to do when he rose from the dead. And the other one has to do with when Shaul was going to the people and teaching. So um, a lot of people will say, well, there's a legitimate reason why it says that. And it's supposed to be one of the, uh, the first of the Sabbath, but that word in the Greek isn't first. There is a word for first and it just means one. So, there was a gentleman who originally helped put together the Greek lexicons, and he mentioned then about that very thing that they were translating one of the Sabbaths as first day of the week, and they would pretty much go carte blanche and translate things willy-nilly how they pleased on certain topics, in particular, hiding the resurrection, promoting Sunday, and hiding the shape of the earth. Both things, contrivances of Rome that lead to atheism or lack of belief. You can see that predominantly if you just pay attention to how our country's been since the 1960s and they faked the moon missions, making them believe in a false concept of creation. It's when they took prayer out of school. They stopped praying in, in schools, made it illegal, took the Bible out. I mean, uh, our, it's a horrendous atrocity. atrocity what's being done, but all because of that kind of ignorance that was forced upon the people. 
So this is a constitution concerning the great passion or Passover week. It says, you should therefore fast on the days of the Passover, beginning from the first day of the week until the preparation. And the Shabbat, it says, this would be the first of unleavened bread, a high, not weekly Shabbat. Six days making use of only bread and salt and herbs and water for your drink. But do you abstain on these days from wine and flesh? For they are days of lamentation and not of feasting. You who are able should fast the, the day of the preparation and the Shabbat day entirely, meaning Passover and the first of unleavened bread, tasting nothing till the cock crowing of the night. But if anyone is not able to join them both together, at least let him observe the Shabbat day, the, which would be the first day of unleavened bread. For Yahuwah says somewhere speaking of himself, when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, in those days shall they fast. In these days, therefore, he was taken from us by the Yahudim, falsely so named, and fastened to the tree, and was numbered among the transgressors. Yeshayahu 53.12 Concerning the watching all the night of the great Shabbat, and concerning the day of the resurrection. Wherefore we exhort you to fast on those days, but we all or as we also fasted till the evening. Now, this right here is a statement of fact that I encourage you all to test for yourselves. If you read through every account, starting Yahukanon chapter twelve, Luke chapter twenty one, or is it Matith Yahoo chapter twenty one and Mark chapter eleven? Read through those, and you'll see that not once do they eat during the day at that entire week. It's never mentioned. So exactly what they walked out with him is what they're enjoining us to do. Although a little bit of the order is out of place because they had the Last Supper on the last day they were with him instead of on the Shabbat there. But you, you'll get the gist of what they're talking about in just a moment. But it says, as we also fasted till the evening, when he was taken away from us, but on the rest of the days, before the day of preparation, let everyone eat at the ninth hour, or at the evening, or as everyone is able. But from the evening of the fifth day, till cock crowing, break your fast when it is daybreak, of one of the Sabbaths, which is Yahuwah's day, which our Mashiach said he was master of the Shabbat, right? From the evening till cock crowing, keep awake and assemble together in the assembly. Watch and pray and entreat Elohim, reading when you sit up all night, the law, the foretellers, and the Psalms until cock crowing and immersing your instructed. Right? This is the important thing right here. All throughout the recognitions of Clement, when you have Kepha teaching and preaching to the people, he would regularly have them fast for three days and then immerse them. The only exception he gave to having a multi-day fast before they were immersed was to Mat Matilda, Clement, Asita, and Achilla's mother. And it was because of her consciousness of the importance of the immersion that he allowed her to just fast one day, but it was still required because it's part of being a believer. It's going through the proper steps. But they fast, 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 immerse, and then they're born again. And that, that was the picture that they have. Right, that's why they have them fasting all this week, and it was traditional that new neophyte believers would keep the Passover and be immersed, 
And this is a, a long time when they're initiated either on the Passover week or they would keep their fast just like the children over here. When they were brought out of the Exodus, they were told to abstain from relations with their wives one, two, three days, and then boom, they were given the covenant the 15th of the third month. Right? So it's still an abstaining, a fasting, if you will, and then rejoicing. The born again experience after they had already went through the waters. But it says, until cock crowing and immersing your instructed and reading the good news with fear and trembling and speaking to the people such things as tend to their deliverance. I just want to real quick. A lot of people are flippant or they're very cocky. I mean, yeah, you have a lot to be grateful for. If you can comprehend the truth, it's a gift from above. But if we don't come to the truth in fear and trembling, realizing our poverty, realizing that we're wicked sinners, and he is almighty, all powerful, and there is nothing compared to him. If that doesn't, if that doesn't put the fear in you, I, I don't, I don't know what will. But we're required to come to the truth in fear and trembling, to tremble at the word which you've heard, because it, he's awesome, and there is no respecting persons. He comes for a contrite, a contrite heart he does not despise. But pride is a servant of Satan, right? All the sons of pride are Leviathans, if you recall. So we want to be very circumspect. We want to fear and tremble before our maker. We want to be humble. And when you're fasting and afflicting your being, a lot of people can get short-tempered. A lot of people can have issues, but this is the time when we're suffering through these things to keep in mind what he suffered for us and to humble ourselves. And if you do that, it, it helps a great deal in how you can interact with others. But it says, And reading the good news with fear and trembling and speaking to the people such things as tend to their deliverance. Put an end to your sorrow and beseech Elohim that Yisrael may be converted and that he will allow them a place of repentance and the remission of their impiety. For the judge, who was a stranger, washed his hands and said, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man. See to it. But Yisrael cried out, His blood be on us and on our children. Matith Yahu 27, 24, and 25. And when Pilate has said, Shall I impale your king? They cried out, We have no king but Caesar. Impale him, impale him. For every one, sorry, for every one that makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. And if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. And Pilatus, the governor, and Herod the king commanded him to be staked. And that oracle was fulfilled, which says, Why did the nations rage, and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against Yahuwah and against his Mashiach. And they cast away the beloved as a dead man who is abominable. Yes, Yahu 14.19 and since he was impaled on the day of the preparation, which is Passover, preparation for the first of unleavened bread, right? And rose again at break of day on Yahuwah's yom, or day, the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Arise, Elohim, judge the earth, for you shall have an inheritance in all the nations. And again, I will arise, says Yahuwah, I will put him in safety. I will wax bold through him. And, but you, Yahuwah, have mercy upon me, and raise me up again, and I shall requite them. For this reason you should also, now that Yahuwah is arisen, offer your offering concerning which he made a constitution by us, saying, Do this for remembrance of me. 
meaning partaking of the, the bread and wine, right? Luke twenty two nineteen. And thenceforward leave off your fasting and rejoice and keep a festival because Yahushua Mashiach, the pledge of our resurrection, is risen from the dead. And let this be an everlasting ordinance till the consummation of the world, until Yahuwah come. For to the Yahudim, Yahuwah is still dead. And they don't even call in his name or even use his name in theirs anymore. Right? But to Nazarim, or branches, he is risen. To the former by their unbelief, to the latter by their full assurance of belief. For the expectation in him is immortal and eternal life. After eight days, let there be another feast observed with honor, first fruits, the eighth day itself, on which he gave me Thomas, or Toma, who was hard of belief, full assurance, by showing me the print of the nails and the wound made in his side by the spear. Yahukanon 20, 25. And that right here, after eight days, if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, after first fruits at sunset in the evening, it was all the twelve gathered with Toma that he appeared to them and he allowed him to touch them. When he resurrected here and they saw him, he would not allow the women to touch him because he said he had not yet ascended to his father. But after first fruits, he allowed it. Again, lining up perfectly with the calendar. This is after eight days, let there be another feast observed with honor. The eighth day itself on which he gave me Toma, who was hard of belief, full assurance, by showing me the print of the nails and the wound made in his side by the spear. And again, from the first Yahuwah's Yom, or day, count 40 days. From Yahuwah's day till the fifth day of the week the fifth of the third month, and celebrate the feast of the ascension of Yahuwah, whereon he finished all his dispensation and constitution. It mentions elsewhere here, and it also mentions at the beginning of the book of Acts, I believe. But after his ascension, he spent those next 40 days giving him the, the apostolic constitutions, the constitutions for his kingdom, if you will. This is, and returned to that El and Father that sent him, and sat down at the right hand of power, and remains there until his enemies are put under his feet, who also will come at the consummation of the world with power and great esteem, to judge the quick and the dead, and to recompense to every one according to his works. And then shall they see the beloved Son of El whom they pierced, Zakar Yahu 2.10, Yahukanan 1937. And when they know him, they shall mourn for themselves, tribe by tribe, and their wives apart. So one more time real quick, just so you can see it. Starting right here on the 26th of the first month, you count 40 days. And that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 30, so that's 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. Fortieth day is the fifth day of the third month, which is 10 days before Shavuot, and it never changes. It's always going to be the fifth day of the week, meaning you can always backtrack and see when first fruits was supposed to be. Backtracked for when that Shabbat was, right? When the unleavened bread was kept in Pesach being the third day of the week, the 14th day of the first month. And that would also show you that the first day of the year is the fourth day of the week. Another way you can find that out is with the Exodus account, specifically 
when they're doing the, the bread and the manna in the wilderness, they're given the night before he's given, or in the night, the evening of the sixth day, they're given meat to eat, or sorry, on the 16th of the month after they had stopped, in that evening, after sunset, they're given meat to eat. And then the next morning, on the first of the week, they're giving manna for six days. And then another Shabbat, where they had a double portion and they did not get anything on the Sabbath day, because he doesn't do labors on that day. You could backtrack from the 16th there, all the way to figure out when the first day of the week is but there's two witnesses for determining that this is the proper way to, to reckon the calendar sorry if that sounds confusing we can go over it more again in detail some other time okay or later on if you need to so it says a foretelling predict a foretelling prediction concerning mashiach yahushua it says, for even now, on the tenth day of the seventh month, when they assemble together, they read the lamentations of Yahu, in which it is said, the Ruach before our face, Mashiach Yahuwah, was taken in their destructions. Lamentations 4.20 And Baruch, in whom it is written, this is our El. No other shall be esteemed with him. He found out every way of knowledge and showed it to Jacob his son and Yisrael his beloved. Afterwards he was seen upon earth and conversed with men. That's from Baruch 3, 35 through 37. And when they read them, they lament and be well as themselves suppose that desolation which happened by Nebuchadnezzar. But as the truth shows, they unwillingly make a prelude to that lamentation which will overtake them, meaning the destruction that happened in 70 AD by Vespasian and Titus. Yet after ten days from the ascension, which from the first fruits is the fiftieth day, Keep a great festival, for on that day, at the third hour, Yahuwah Yahushua sent on us the gift of the Ruach, or the Kodesh Ruach, and we were filled with his energy, and we spoke with new tongues, as that Ruach did suggest to us, Acts 2.4. And we preached both to Yahudi and Gentiles that he is the Mashiach of El, who is determined by him to be the judge of quick and dead. Acts 10.42 To him did Moshe bear witness and said, Yahuwah received fire from Yahuwah and rained it down. Bereshit or Genesis, uh, Genesis 19.24 This is explained, this passage right here is explained specifically um, it's mentioned right here in the Apostolic Constitutions, but also Irenaeus in his Against Heresies specifically mentions that it was the father who's in the Shemaim, or sorry, the father, right, who was in the Shemaim that gave the power and authority and sent the fire to Yahuwah, our Mashiach, on the earth who rained it down, and that was to show that the Father gave him all authority, that he appeared with men, that he would eat with them, and that he was given all judgment. This is him did Jacob see as a man, and said, I have seen El face to face, and my inner being is preserved. Bereshit 32.20 Him did Abraham entertain, and acknowledge him to be the judge and his Yahuwah. Genesis 18, 1-33. Him did Moshe see in the bush, meaning the one speaking from the burning bush was our Mashiach, who was also the one that was on the top of Mount Sinai that gave the covenant to the children. He was the one who made the covenant with them, and he's the one that ratified it in his own blood. 
Concerning him did he speak in Deuteronomy, a foreteller will Yahuwah your Elohim raise up unto you out of your brethren like me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall be that every inner being that will not hear that foreteller shall be destroyed from among his people. Deuteronomy 18.15 Him did Yahushua, the son of Nun, see as the prince of Yahuwah's hosts in armor for their assistance against Yericho, to whom he fell down and worshipped as a servant does to his master. Yahushua 5.14 and this is a refutation to anyone that says that, the, that our Mashiach was never worshipped. You have men, even when he was walking in the flesh, that bowed down to him and showed reverence. Yahushua, the son of Nun, did. Moshe did at the burning bush. All the children did at the mountain. He, he is the one that every knee will bow to. Him, Shemuel knew as the Mashiach of El, 1 Samuel 12.3. And thence named the Kohanim and the kings Hamashiach, or the anointed. Him Dawid knew and sung a hymn concerning him, a song concerning the beloved. Now, that's usually in the beginning of the Psalms, you'll see Mesmor la Dawid or Shir la Dawid, something, a psalm or a song, and then it's concerning or by. Dawid, they say, but that very same Hebrew means concerning beloved. And that's the context. Every time you see that where it says by David or, or by Dawid before a psalm, every single one of those you can take as the person of our Mashiach speaking himself or the actual events that he himself would walk out or do. Without fail, those are all foretellings in that regard, and you can see it everywhere that those are written like that. You even have Psalms in the Odes of Shalomo, or the Psalms of Shalomo, but the Odes in particular, where it's in his person that he's actually speaking. Just like you have him speaking sometimes, or the Father has speaks in his person through the Mashiach. Our Mashiach will speak through people via his Ruach, or the word of truth in their mouth, on occasion as well. But in this particular instance, this is a psalm that's concerning the beloved, and he adds in his person and says, Gird your sword upon your thigh, you who are mighty in your beauty and renown. Go on and prosper and reign for the sake of truth and meekness and righteousness, and your right hand shall guide you after a wonderful manner. Your darts are sharpened, you that are mighty. The people shall fall under you in the heart of the king's enemies. Wherefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Psalm 45 Concerning him also spoke Shalomo, as in his person, meaning as, as our Mashiach was speaking through Shalomo, as he, like, like he was the one talking, and this is quoting Proverbs 8. Okay. It says, Yahuwah created me the beginning of his ways for his works. Before the world, he founded me. In the beginning, before he made the earth, before the fountains of waters came. Before the mountains were fastened, he begot me before all the hills. Proverbs 8, 22 through 25. And again, Chokma built herself a house. Proverbs 9, 1. Concerning him also, Yeshayahu said, A branch shall come out of the root of Yeshai, and a flower shall spring out of his root. And there shall be a root of Yeshai, and he that is to rise to reign over the nations, in him shall the nations trust. Yeshayahu 11, 1 and 10. And Zakar Yahu says, Behold, your king comes unto you, righteous and having deliverance, meek and riding upon a donkey, and upon a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And that's when you see that he rode in on a, a female donkey and its colt, right? 
it was foretold right here and we've already talked about how that was reminiscent of him coming the truth being brought in to you to the world through the first covenant believers who were like the wild donkey of a man representative of Yishmael, because hagar was the first covenant of mount sinai right so Yishmael, those who hear believe and do right those who hear l are the, considered the first covenant believers who were equated to wild donkeys or those that without bit and bridle would not obey. This is, and that's from Zakar Yahu 9, 9, right? Him Daniel describes as the son of Adam coming to the father and receiving all judgment and honor from him. Daniel 7, 13. And as the stone cut out of the mountain without hands and becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth and dashing to pieces the many governments of the smaller countries and the polytheism of mighty ones, but preaching the one L, Daniel 2.34. Concerning him also did Yahu foretell, saying the Ruach before his face, Mashiach Yahuwah, was taken in their snares, of whom it was said, Under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Lamentations 4.20 Yehezkiel also, and the following foretellers, affirm everywhere that he is the Mashiach Yahuwah, the king, the judge, the lawgiver, the messenger of the father, the only begotten El. The uh, it says in Yeshiyahu, before me there was no L formed, and after me there is none. The Father is unbegotten, but our Mashiach is the only begotten L, right? Him, therefore, do we also preach to you and declare him to be L the Word, who ministered to his L and Father for the creation of the world. By believing in him, you shall live but by disbelieving you shall be punished. For he that is disobedient to the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of Elohim abides on him. Yahuchanan 3.36 Therefore, after you have kept the festival of Shavuot, keep one more week festival, and then I put Kodesh of the first of the fourth month, which is a Sabbath, right? And after that, fast, for it is reasonable to rejoice for the gift of Elohim, and to fast after that relaxation. For both Moshe and Eliyahu fasted forty days, and Daniel for three weeks of days did not eat desirable bread, and flesh and wine did not enter into his mouth, and Baruch Hanan when she asked for Shemuel, said, I have not drunk wine nor strong drink, and I pour out my ruach before Yahuwah. 1 Samuel 1.15 And the Ninevites, when they fasted three days and three nights, Yonah 3.5, escaped the execution of wrath. And Esther and Mordecai and Yahudith, by fasting, escaped the insurrection of the unrighteous whole ferns and Haman. And Dawid says, My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh fails for want of oil. Do you therefore fast and ask your petitions of Elohim? We enjoin you to fast every fourth day of the week and every day of the preparation and the surplus or the surplusage of your fast bestow upon the needy. You can also find this gone into detail. I believe it might be in the Didache or the, the teaching of the Twelve, as they call it, but it's most certainly in what they call the Shepherd of Hermas. One of his commandments was how to keep a perfect fast and how to... Um, he goes over how to pray. When you pray, you afflict your being and your, your petitions will be heard on high. So they usually, if you're desiring things, you fast and pray for it. You afflict yourself, you give to the needy, and that's a perfect fast. But before you abstain from food and give it to the poor, 
your fast has to be abstaining from sin, not doing any evil. And that is considered a great and perfect fast before a maker. You can skip eating meals all day of the week, uh, any day of the week. You can give that to someone in need. And if you don't have love or if you're still an adulterer or a thief or a liar, it means nothing. It's not going to achieve anything that you expect it to. This is every Sabbath day, excepting one, rejoice, for he will be guilty of sin who fasts on Yahuwah's yom, being the yom of the resurrection, or being or during the time of Shavuot, or in general, who is sad on a festival day to Yahuwah. For on them we ought to rejoice and not to mourn. And then I said, it's also the Shepherd of Hermas, book three, fifth parable, which is the one that covers fasting, like I just mentioned. So, Av willing, that was edifying for everyone. I know it does not cover how to keep the fall feasts. There is no mention of how the uh, the renewed covenant is supposed to keep them. It should have been written here, and obviously it's not. We do have mention in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Day of Atonement was given to be kept differently based on the rules of those who were in Damascus, but we don't have the rules on how to keep that. So, and in particular, if you're a part of the Renewed Covenant, if you're a born-again believer, you've been immersed in his name in truth, and you've had the adverse, the adversarial spirit or the devil's ruach cast away from you you have no more temptations you're you're like the first fruits of the age to come just like the emissaries just like the early believers back then if that's true for you then there's no reason to mourn and afflict your being on the 10th of the seventh month because you're not doing any unintentional sin but for anyone who's not yet perfected for anyone who's still walking in sin or has mistakes that happen Begging forgiveness and afflicting your being on this day is required. And you can see that for sure. I mean, to know for certain that you should be doing the, the festivals there. Everyone who does not afflict their being of all the unintentional sinners on that day, on the 10th day of the seventh month, or what they call Yom HaKippurim, the day of coverings or atonement, then you're given over to Satan to go along with the malicious sinners to do with what he will. And he takes them into the wasteland to destroy them, it mentions. You can find that information specifically in chapter 14 of the book of Gad the Seer. But uh, I thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful Yom, uh, the, the, the wonderful Shabbat and Shabuatov ahead. We'll see you next time.